connecting. All right, we are good to go. Jessica, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, great, thank you. We're just, um, thank you all so much for um, putting your introductions in the chat. It was really nice to read and see where you're all coming from. Um, I wanna take a moment to read our land acknowledgement statement before we go any further. Portland, Oregon, where we are, lies within the traditional homelands of the Multnomah, Oregon City, Tumwater, Watlala, and Clackamas Chinooks, and the Tualatin Kalapuya peoples who were relocated to the Grand Ron Reservation under the Kalapuya, et cetera, 1855 ratified treaty, Willamette Valley Treaty of 1855. Today, these tribes are a part of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde. The Grand Ronde people continue to maintain a connection to their ancestral homelands and maintain their traditional cultural practices. I know many of you are joining us from other places um, and we welcome you and are really excited to spend a little bit of time with you. Um, we have a packed agenda, so I don't wanna spend too long here. I know we're all pros after the year that we've had, but um, just, you know, just for, for the sake of it, um, you all are probably muted right now. Um, that would be great. We would love for you to um, use the chat to communicate or to ask questions. I think after Joe's um, initial portion, Amanda's gonna maybe take some questions in the chat and then we're gonna do our best to get to as many of them as possible at the very end. So um, that's sort of our plan for questions. And then just because we would like to make sure that we're communicating with you appropriately, please um, put your, your at least your first name and pronouns if you'd like into your, um, your little zoom box you can do that by clicking on the three dots in the upper right hand corner or the three dots next to your name under the participants list i'm totally guilty of um, joining spaces and it just says like iphone or something so we're just looking forward to engaging with you as much as we can on this digital platform all right so our next uh point of uh on the agenda is to um let you get a chance to get to know each other um, a little bit better so we're gonna pop out of the slides and we're gonna put you into some breakout rooms. And I'm thinking about five minutes um, and maybe breakout rooms of five-ish, Amanda. I'm, I think you're on mm -hmm. top of that, but our goal is that you'll just introduce yourselves, um, You know, where, what kind of work you do in a school community, your name, um, and then answer this question for each other. How do students know what your community or classroom norms and values are? What do you say? What do you hang on the walls, et cetera? So um, that's your opener. And we will see you um, in five-ish minutes when you're back from your breakout rooms. All right, breakout rooms are open. Oh, I didn't open all rooms. Oh my gosh, y'all. <laughs> I just see you all staring at me. <laughs> like, what's going on? <laughs> always a good thing when they're staying there so long. I know. <laughs> There's just never enough time for us to get to be together. All right, everyone, as you begin to join us back, if you could in the chat, just write one thing of how you know your students um, or how, how your students know your community or classroom norms or values. So again, as you just come back, just put in the chat one thing that you shared with everybody of how students know your classroom norms or values. <laughs> Nick, I love this. <laughs> That's a very high school thing to say. <laughs> All right, so as everybody is back from the breakout rooms, again, if you could just put one thing in the chat of what you shared of how your students know what your classroom and or community norms and values are. While you're doing that, I'm just going to give you a sense of what's coming next. Um, so we've done introductions. We're going to launch here in a second into a history and rise of anti-democratic and white nationalist movements. We'll talk about some tools and strategies for educators. We'll do a scenario activity where you'll be in breakout rooms again, and then we will make sure to leave time for your questions um, at the very end. And I think I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Amanda. All right, so I'm just like looking at what everybody has. Um, we wanted to start off 
with that aspect of uh, norms and values because as you have these difficult conversations or you need to call students out or you need to respond to things, it's important to remember that you're all part of the community together and how do you set those norms and values? So I'm gonna, um, after this session, take down some of the notes that people shared because sometimes it's nice to see what other people have on there and I'll include them in the resource list. Um, oh my gosh, Ralph, wow, love it. I will definitely include that. Um, I will include that in the resource list in the follow-up email. So Joe is going to start off and get a, give us some background history about the rise of anti-democratic and white nationalist movements. Um, he's our kind of historian expert here. So Joe, it's all on you. Joe, are you here anymore? Are you on mute? There, I'm unmuted. Hi. Oh my gosh. There you are. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> it's been a long day. Uh, thank you, uh, Amanda, and uh, thank you, uh, everyone else, for being here. To, I feel really privileged to be part of this uh, conversation, of this professional development. I have uh, two kids who are um, one just entered high school this year, and the other one's a high school junior at uh, South Eugene High School here in Eugene. Uh, we're on Kalapuya land, occupied land. Um, so I, um, what I thought I would do is just give a quick kind of background yeah. on um, first some working definitions of democracy and anti-democracy. So we kind of might have some shared sense of what we're talking about with, with each of those terms. Uh, and then talk a little bit about the state of Oregon and its own kind of troubled legacy around some of these things. Uh, and then uh, talk specifically a little bit about the history of um, anti-democratic, authoritarian, fascist, and white nationalist movements in Oregon. Um, and that will kind of you know, open us up to, I'll, I'll do it kind of quickly and cursorily. If you want to talk more in depth um, in the question and answer, that's great too. I um, have been studying the right and the, law and the, and the far right for um, a lot of years now. So I, I, I know more about it than I, wish I did. Um, okay, so let's, uh, I'm gonna be asking Jessica to help me out um, using control of the, the slides here. Um, okay, so I decided uh, maybe the easy thing to do was to go to the Oxford English Dictionary for a good definition of democracy for us to work with. And one of the definitions is that it's a form of government in which sovereign power resides in the people as a whole and is exercised either directly by them or by officers elected by them. This much we all know, um, it's not, there's nothing controversial about it, but democracy gets kind of sticky because it's, um, some people uh, have a sense of it as just pure majoritarianism, whoever's the largest group gets to kind of, you know, vote their way into or have kind of a cultural, um, you know, sense of supremacy over what happens, uh, how decisions are made, how conversations are had. Um, but it's actually, there's many other ways to think about democracy. And so Jessica, if you would slide, uh, advance the next one. We can also think of democracy as a, a political and ethical ideal um, in order to actually have the practice of democracy, either in a classroom or at the, in a community or uh, a subnational state or a nation, uh, you need kind of uh, commitments and ethics that people have to uh, making, making kind of what is essentially a question of how we collectively rule ourselves, how that works. Uh, and so some of these ideals that we work with, I think all of us, again, these are not gonna be um, uh, strange to us or in any way controversial, but one of them is equality, that we treat each other as, as equals, uh, in equal regard to how we, um, take in viewpoints from each other, how we treat each other, uh, the space we give to each other. Inclusion is another one. That democracy requires um, a certain kind of capaciousness and openness to, to everyone to be part. The idea of anyone who is um, subject to a decision, subject to a form of rule, subject to an, any kind of issue, uh, ought to have some decision-making power or a say in, in how things are decided. So that's one way we might think about inclusion that's connected to participation, that people need means to participate, either through voting, through discussion, debate, uh, um, or, or other um, kinds of actions, which are, which are uh, directly allow them to 
impact the larger, um, larger political culture or more specifically um, decision-making process. And finally, um, uh, negotiation of different viewpoints that the slightly fancier term that political scientists use is pluralism. The idea that we, we all have different ideas of the good, we all have different ideas of what's right, we all have different ideas of how things should be done, and we have to negotiate those in ways that allow us to compromise, to hear each other, uh, and not to always agree, because we will never fully agree, we will never fully reach consensus on all kinds of things, but, um, but, the, but our ethic is that we hear each other in, in negotiating and deciding how we, how we do things. And so these are some of the um, kind of basic elements of a democratic culture that I think that um, we all try to practice in some ways in our classrooms, in our communities and elsewhere. Next. So this then brings us to the other side of the coin, which is anti-democratic movements uh, and ideas. The, um, the reason I think we, we've hit on this idea of anti-democratic as opposed to saying racist or white nationalist or bigoted or whatever else is that the, the, one of the things that is really at the heart of, of uh, forms of exclusion are that they are anti-democratic, that they kind of go against basic values that we want to have in our civic culture. Uh, racism and white nationalism are anti-democratic because they, they demean other people, they deny equality, uh, and they exclude. Authoritarian movements, uh, proto-fascist movements or other kinds of, of movements are anti-democratic for obvious reasons. They don't, uh, they don't include different viewpoints or different modes of participation or decision-making. Religious supremacism, of course, everyone who is, uh, has a set of religious commitments or an anti-religious commitment believes that they're probably right. Uh, nevertheless, in a shared public culture, in a shared civic culture, uh, we, we can't impose those ideas on others. Patriarchy and misogyny, there's been, of course, a, a long struggle in this country and a long struggle worldwide to, um, uh, to move past um, dominant forms of male rule uh, and male control and male violence. And these still uh, play a role in um, white nationalist and anti-democratic movements, uh, as well as they, they filter into the culture in many ways all the time. And then finally, another one would be political violence and intimidation. Um, uh, movements that uh, attempt to achieve their uh, ends by, by force, by in intimidation, by, um, you know, we can think of many forms of harassment, many forms of intimidation, many forms of open coercion, uh, which work uh, as a way of silencing people of excluding people, of driving people out, or uh, making them shamed and humiliated uh, um, are, would be of course, anti-democratic as well. Okay, next slide. So I wanted to talk a little bit about Oregon's own troubled history, um, as I said, before getting into the, the specifics. Um, next slide. We, as, as we know, um, the, area, the region we now refer to as Oregon was home to uh, a, a wide variety of indigenous cultures and languages and practices. And it's something we all know. And we, we began this with a land acknowledgement uh, to start with, but it's important to think that there are other possible ways to imagine space and imagine um, who is still here, uh, not just who was here and what that means, what that means for forms of popular sovereignty even the imposition of a United States, right, or a state of Oregon um, was uh, an act of um, extraordinary violence, uh, which, which, you know, both through open violence by the state, by white settlers, by disease, uh, changed the, the very landscape of, of who was here and what was practiced. Next. Um, as we know, uh, you all know, because many of you teach this, white settlement uh, begins in earnest in the, uh, in the 1840s, um, when many settlers are coming across the Oregon Trail, many white Euro European settlers across the Oregon Trail, um, coming into the state. Uh, there were political elites here, sought out people across this time period from uh, in the Midwest and the Northeast, wanting uh, uh, particularly Northern Europeans to settle in this area. Uh, next slide. And this was authorized in part in the mid, uh, from 
uh, in the mid 19th century from the idea of manifest destiny or the idea that, um, that white Anglo-Saxons were destined to take over the North American continent, moving from the East to the West, following the setting sun, to, uh, to live a, a dream of um, kind of white repu small r republicanism or white democracy uh, and culture and civilization uh, at the expense of people um, already here. And this was deeply in the, in the culture of uh, an American culture generally. Um, in specific ways, it becomes part of uh, Oregon culture and our uh, kind of cherishing and championing the idea of the pioneer, of the settler. You know, think of all the, the kids who have played the Oregon Trail game over the, over the course of years. And it's often, uh, we don't necessarily stop to think about what that, what that entailed, not just at the time, but what it still uh, does in terms of how people imagine the land, the connect, their connection to the land, what they are owed by the land, and who is allowed to be here. Next slide, please. Okay. The next chapter of Oregon's history, which is an extraordinary one, in some ways sets off Oregon from much of the country, uh, is that um, as a, in its territorial constitution, uh, Oregon excludes African Americans. There are, in the provisional government, territorial government, there are um, both uh, Union and Confederate supporters or, or slavery and anti-slavery supporters in the 1850s. Uh, but one thing that almost everyone in the legislature was united on was uh, a, an anti-Black sentiment, an opposition to Black people um, altogether. And so in the um, territorial government enacts a law that um, requires Black people enslaved or free to be whipped twice a year uh, until they uh, leave the territory. So this is something that's really built into the very idea of Oregon, built into its very founding is an anti-Black sentiment or the idea of building Oregon into a, a uh, white utopia. So it's a, it's a racial, you can think of the state of Oregon, unfortunately, as kind of a racial project from, its, from the very start, both from indigenous dislocation and uh, um, anti-Black racism. Next slide, please. Okay, in 1859, Oregon becomes a state. Um, it's the only state admitted to the Union with an exclusion law written uh, that bans, quote, any, quote, free Negro mulatto not residing in the state at the time from living, holding real estate, or making contacts within the state. So even as it becomes a state uh, into the, uh, when it joins the union, it is, um, it's set up as an anti-Black state. Next slide. Throughout um, Oregon's history uh, from the late 19th century and across the 20th century, there are forms of uh, exclusion of Black people through um, uh, residential discrimination, housing covenants, uh, employment uh, discrimination, uh, and outright, uh, outright violence. This is just one example that the 1902 lynching of Alonzo Tucker, um, who's a man in what is now Coos Bay, who was accused uh, but not tried for uh, raping a white woman. He was um, killed, lynched, hung from a bridge, and the local press uh, described the, um, the lynching as uh, an orderly process of bringing justice. Uh, so you can see it's the kind of thing that you, we imagine happening and know of happening in the American South where I'm originally from, uh, but Oregon, like many states, but Oregon was among the worst uh, to have kind of targeted um, kind of social violence, not even just state sanctioned violence, but, but uh, popular voluntaristic racist violence. Next slide, please, Jessica, thank you. Um, as I said, Blacks are excluded across the 20th century. Um, people in Portland know it well through redlining there and through neighborhoods uh, in the worst land made available. Uh, this is something that continues today through forms of gentrification in Portland. Um, uh, again, residential restrictions, housing covenants. We, uh, this is across the state. Here in Eugene, um, there was extraordinary um, uh, segregation uh, in, in Eugene, which I could talk about at more length if anybody's from here. Uh, but this was also backed up, as it still is, with um, uh, a police violence as well, which kept, which kept numbers of African Americans from coming into the state. And this is something else when people think about Oregon as being, you know, uh, a very white state. Part of it is by historical design. Part of it is by, um, you know, sheer 
um, shear exclusion. Okay, next slide. Okay, the Chinese and Oregon um, uh, play an important role um, across time. And this is uh, something else that is um, uh, to know about. The Chinese begin coming to Oregon, to the West Coast and to Oregon um, in the 1850s and 1860s, or really in the 1840s first, uh, to work, in, uh, uh, work on the Transcontinental Railroad, to work as fishermen, to work in salmon canning factories, to work on uh, in mining claims uh, in, in cities like Portland, to work uh, in laundries or in restaurants. Uh, there are places in Oregon where, where mobs drove Chinese workers out of small towns and workplaces. Um, this happened in an extraordinary peak uh, territory wide in the winter of 1885 and the summer of 1886. Uh, many Chinese expelled across Oregon made their way to Portland where they settled in um, the city's Asian district or the Chinatown there. Uh, in Portland, Chinese were more tolerated in part because of close commercial shipping ties to China. But uh, the anti-Chinese violence, which was known throughout the, throughout the American West, uh, was powerful here. It shaped the culture of Oregon in many ways um, and uh, was uh, kind of authorized nationally through um, uh, anti-Chinese anti exclusion laws uh, and anti-Chinese citizenship laws in 1882 at the, at the national, uh, national level, partly driven uh, by the efforts of white labor uh, in California, but across the West generally. Next slide. And here's a political uh, cartoon from the time. There's Oregon, um, you know, which is, this cartoon kind of speaks for itself. Uh, Hobson's choice, you can go or stay to um, face uh, white violence or, uh, or leave at your peril. Uh, next slide. Uh, the Oregon Constitution also, I wanted to really keep em emphasizing the role of the state here, the role of the state of Oregon. Uh, Article 9, Section 8 of the Oregon Constitution stated that no, quote, no Chinaman, not a resident of the state at the adoption of this constitution shall ever hold any real estate or mining claim or work any mining claim uh, therein. This again is like the uh, uh, anti-black bans from 1859. These are, um, these are forms of racial exclusion, which again set up uh, a level of, of white sovereignty and white rights and white ownership possibilities and white, uh, white property against those of, of the Chinese. Chinese are also banned from interracial marriage, from attending public schools, from entering professions, uh, or from living outside designated areas. Okay, next slide. Okay, so that there's more to say about all these things, um, but I'm going to move on quickly to talk about the specifics of far right organizing uh, in in Oregon itself. Next slide. Okay, thank you. So um, the Ku Klux Klan, as many of you know, has a long history uh, in Oregon. The original Klan, the first wave of the Klan, was was in the American South at the end of uh, Reconstruction. Um, there to kind of enforce and, uh, um, uh, white suffrage and end, end the black vote and, in, and essentially install Jim Crow in the American South and, and reinstall white power and white terror there. But the Klan grows again uh, in the kind of period between World War I and World War II and it becomes a national movement then. And it becomes a national movement partly in response to Eastern and Southern European immigration from Europe these are Italians, Slavs, Jews, and others coming across who uh, um, white Northern European Americans are feeling anxious about. Um, and this is something widely shared. Theodore Roosevelt in 1904, uh, um, you know, raises the, the, the warning that uh, the good old stock Northern European Americans are being outproduced by these swarthy Southern Europeans. Uh, but it's also, the Klan is also still aimed at, uh, um, at African Americans and at, uh, and at Asian Americans, both Chinese and Japanese. And so the Klan plays an important role uh, in Oregon political history, as it did in a number of states, but here very strongly, once again, um, at the height of its popularity, the Klan uh, claims that 15% of eligible uh, white men are members in Oregon. Some of the individuals in this bottom picture here uh, include the Portland police chief, a district attorney, a U.S. attorney, a Multnomah County sheriff, uh, and the Portland mayor. 
The Klan's reign in Oregon is brief but notorious. Uh, among other things, the organization influences the election in 1922, uh, unseating the gubernatorial incumbent, Ben Olcott, who is an outspoken critic of the Klan. So the Klan is, is you know, statewide, uh, very deeply involved in local politics. This picture on the um, upper uh, uh, right-hand corner is uh, is Eugene. That's that's Willamette Avenue, and up on Skinner's Butte is big KKK, which was there uh, for a long time during the twenties. Okay, next slide. Uh, so there were also there's no shortage of other organizations in the 1920s and 30s, which were kind of fascist, uh, ultra-nationalist, or anti-Semitic uh, organizations. Uh, many of whom had, were sympathetic to Mussolini or uh, sympathetic to Hitler. Um, a, a number of them had names like uh, the Friends of New Germany, or later became the German American Bund, uh, the Silver Legion of America, also known as the Silver Shirts, the American Defenders, uh, Americans Incorporated. Uh, these groups were all in Oregon as well as in other parts of the country. Um, they, they had predominance here. And they often worked with, for instance, the uh, Portland Police Department, its Red Squad, uh, to attack um, uh, communist and left-wing labor organizers. Uh, so this was, this was something that had, had a life, um, less so after World War II. The idea of being an open fascist or a, or a neo-Nazi member or kind of being connected to white supremacy is something that's uh, understandably less popular after World War II than it was before when the country had mobilized entirely in a war against racial fascism in Europe. Next slide, please, Jessica, if you would. The next real phase of, um, of far-right organizing that happens in, uh, in this region happens in the 1980s um, and early 1990s. In Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and other parts of Idaho, uh, groups like Aryan Nations and the Order uh, were formed. The Aryan Nations was um, formed in uh, had a big encampment uh, in the um, panhandle of Idaho. The Order was an organization which uh, was active throughout the Northwest, which um, robbed a number of banks and uh, uh, murdered a Jewish uh, radio disc jockey in Denver. Um, and they, but they, these all had a presence here. Many groups. Uh, that became involved in the white power movement, as it was called at the time, were um, Vietnam War vets who had come back. Certainly, this is not to say that Vietnam War vets as a whole uh, were involved in this, or even in the majority in any way. It's a small minority of them, but it was it was veterans who uh, became active in these movements. Not unlike the the fact that uh, veterans of World War One came back and joined fascist movements uh, in the interwar period. Uh, but there, it was a, um, there were violent showdowns between the FBI and these uh, white power organizations um, during the uh, late 1980s. In the late 80s and early 1990s, Portland became a scene of really aggressive uh, neo-Nazi organizing. There was a guy named Tom Metzger, who was a television repairman um, from uh, Southern California, who uh, developed a group called White Aryan Resistance, which he sees as a revolutionary uh, white supremacist uh, group, which is, sees itself in opposition to the, to the American state and to the police and to the FBI, and wants to, um, his vision is to create a white ethno state uh, in the Northwest by having a white racial revolution based on the white working class. His uh, idea was kind of like, if you can imagine like a, a distorted racist version of left-wing politics, what he called third positionism. This is what really defined um, uh, uh, a white area resistance. He began, he began recruiting um, young skinheads into his movement, um, which is something that older white supremacist organizations had avoided doing. They saw these young people as um, degenerates and drug addicts and not worth their time. But Metzger organized at punk rock shows and at skinhead music shows to draw people into this um, into the scene. He was, um, uh, poor, he chose Portland out of an idea that uh, if you can get cities with a less than 10% um, people of color population, you can really organize actively uh, in those scenes and without being, without being attacked, without being much danger. And so at a certain point in the early 90s, there were three or 400 uh, neo-Nazi skins active in Portland. Um, among other things that happened during that time period was the um, the uh, 
beating to death with baseball bats of uh, uh, the Ethiopian immigrant bus driver, uh, Muligat Serwa, um, who was pictured here. And from that event afterwards, uh, Metzger was finally brought down, partly by a civil, civil lawsuit, uh, partly by the, and partly by the actions of a group called Anti-Racist Action, which pulled together um, young anti-racist activists from around the country who began to visit Oregon to help local activists drive out, uh, drive out the Nazis. Okay, next slide. I'm going, going on along here. We are now in a new wave of far-right activity. We have in Portland, uh, particularly a group called Patriot Prayer, which has been on the front lines of what they call themselves as nationalist or pro-Trump uh, organizers. They're strongly anti-immigrant. They are connected to this group on the right called the Proud Boys. They see themselves, call, call themselves Western chauvinists uh, and engage in violence against uh, anti-racist and uh, Black Lives Matter activists. Uh, they don't they don't um, call themselves white supremacists, and that's something we can talk about. Uh, next slide, if you would, please. There's also the Patriot Movement, which is stronger here really than almost anywhere in the country. Uh, this is a movement uh, which is made up of paramilitary organizations, uh, people who join these groups who see themselves as defending uh, the American nation against um, a tyrannical state, uh, as well as against various shadowy um, uh, um, forces, some with, through conspiracy theories, many of which are anti-Semitic and racist. Uh, next slide. Uh, this was partly kicked off or become, became popular through the Malheur Wildlife Refuge occupation in 2016, which many of you know about, if we can talk more about, uh, led by Eamon Bundy, who is now um, has a new group called the People's Rights Network, which is very active across, across Oregon. Next slide. Groups like the Three Percenters, um, who, are, who are kind of a loose knit organization statewide, another group called the Oath Keepers, which is made up self consciously of, um, of war, veterans from the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, are very involved uh, uh, in this movement, um, as is a group called the Constitutional um, Sheriffs and Peace Officers Association, uh, which organizes among police, uh, police and sheriff's departments uh, to resist the idea that uh, law enforcement should obey any laws, any federal laws that they've deemed to be unconstitutional. Uh, next slide. Uh, and then we can think of things like that, that have kind of come to um, a head recently, like a, a state capital invasion in, Dece in December 2020, um, where somebody propped open a door and, and uh, dozens of activists ran in and had an armed standoff uh, with state police officers in the state capital. They smashed a number of windows. It was kind of a precursor to what would happen nationally on January 6th. They themselves came back uh, to the Oregon Capitol on, on January 6th. Some of the stuff has been tied to anti-mask or anti-COVID restriction um, uh, organizing. And I can talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, that's been a very important side of organizing. But um, anyway, the other thing which is worth saying just briefly is that there has been some crossover between the Oregon Republican Party and paramilitary organizations, militia organizations. The chief, uh, the, the new head of the Oregon GOP, Dallas Hurd, uh, was uh, a visitor to the Malheur takeover and was an uh, open supporter. Um, the Republican Party of Oregon is called the January 6th uh, Capitol riot, a false flag operation that was not real, it was something organized by Democrats. Um, and there's more to say about that, but it's kind of, kind of tricky and hazy territory. So I probably spoke too long, but I'm, I'm gonna leave it there. Thank you so much, Joe. Amanda, were you talking? Yeah, I was muted for a second and then <laughs> I was trying to respect Joe. Joe, you're good. So at this time, I'd like, if anybody has a question for Joe, and I'm sure you have a ton, if you wanna put it in the chat and then I can organize. So when we come back from the activity after Jessica, um, I'll have had an opportunity for Joe to, set, to think about some of the questions. Um, so I know, Joe, one of them I definitely want you to think about is what about the fact that our democracy was created as a racist, um, a racist, nationalist, and, and, and misogynistic institution. And so as you, as you very explicitly detailed, um, it seems that our state and our country were founded on very anti-democratic principles, and, but yet we were a democracy. And so one of the things I'd like you to think about while Jessica is doing her session or her portion of the session and everybody is in breakout rooms, how you would suggest to teachers going about talking about that with their students in that messy middle 
of how are we a democracy, but it's not what we would consider a democracy today, in a sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, great. So um, if anybody has any other questions, please feel free to put it in the chat now and I will write it down and slip them to Joe so he can think about them in the next 20 minutes. Awesome, thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Joe. Um, I was thinking as we sort of switch gears to take a look at what some of this stuff um, means for us in schools or how it shows up for us in schools, we might wanna just start with a little decoding exercise. So I'm gonna ask you to um, participate via the chat. Um, so I apologize, Amanda, if there's gonna be a lot of activity in the chat as you're taking questions. I can questions. scroll, it's all good. Okay, good. So this is a quote by um, Bob Dane, who is um, the head of Federation for American Immigration Reform, which is a designated hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center, asked whether he would disavow a goal of maintaining or expanding a European American majority. Bob Dane said, for many, the question of whether a country loses its majority status is a fair question. So I would love for you to pop any ideas you have in the chat. Um, what is he talking about here? What, what stands out to you? Um, what's he saying? What is it? What does majority status mean? What's a fair question? Pop any thoughts that you have in the chat. Yes, majority white. Thank you, Lisa, for getting us going. Um, mm -hmm. Yep, you and Dan were on the same page. Feel free to pop any ideas you have in the chat. European American majority. I think you've got that. Mm hmm. Mm. Yes, in group and out group. Really great points. It points to a lot of demographic anxiety, too, I think. Mm hmm. Yeah, majority and what that means the, the narrow <laughs> um, numerical majority. Mm hmm. Yes, that the most important purpose of the nation is in terms of white identity. I appreciate all these great comments. Yeah, history being only European history. Yeah, great point, thank you. So I think we're, we're all on a similar page here. Um, just to get, just to immerse ourselves a little bit in the rhetoric once more, I think we're gonna do a second, I'm gonna skip the middle one. We're gonna do a second decoding. So now you know the drill. Um, when they say, okay, this type of tyranny is what forced people to feel that there's no other option than to do something drastic, like take over a wildlife refuge or gather militias to hold the federal supremacists back. Um, and then, so this should sound familiar since um, Joe just covered some of this activity. Um, John Robertson has a, a radio show where he interviews local um, politicians and things. So tell me, what do you, what do you notice here? What are people talking about? Um, what keywords stand out? What do you think it means? Same thing, pop it in the chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's certainly some anti-government, anti-democracy stuff going on here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you for that, Nikki. Yeah. Yeah, anti-white, the federal government is anti-white. Great point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a distorted view of, well, I would say it's a distorted view of patriotism for sure. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Sarah, that's a really good point. What is drastic for white protesters would end much differently for non-white folks. Mm -hmm. The violence is a justifiable reaction. Yep. Yeah that armed conflict is the right of the oppressed. Great point. I always pull towards this term, the way of, that they are using the term supremacist here as sort of parroting of some um, maybe more progressive language. Yeah, victim blaming, great, great points. You all have got it. Mm-hmm, they feel like they lost everything. Yep, I've heard that from students too. Mm -hmm. We're gonna talk a little bit about, we're gonna circle back to that. So don't worry, that's gonna come back. Mm-hmm. These are great points. Thank you all so much for engaging me in this. Um, helps me to know that you're out there and we're all in this together. So my plan is just to spend um, not actually very long, maybe five, six minutes or so, um, talking to you a little bit about um, white nationalism and how it might show up in schools. And then we're gonna get you into some breakout rooms and then come back to make sure that we can um, have lots of time for questions. So um, this is the definition that 
um, Western State Center uses, which is the organization that I do this work with, the belief that national identity should be built around white ethnicity and that white people should maintain dominance in demographics, culture, and politics it has a long-term goal of creating an all white ethno state. Um, so you can see pretty clearly in the flyer to the right that white nationalist organizing can manifest publicly without ever talking about race or religion at all. Um, and it, it sort of fuels a lot of their, um, their marketing and promotional um, efforts. We, let's see here. Um, white nationalism is built on uh, these pillars. That's how we identify it. And it's different than um, white supremacy in some ways. And we have to address them both um, in our school communities at the same time, which is a lot of work and, and it's, it's hard. Um, they both threaten our safe learning environment for all students. White supremacy is a uh, institutional um, system and white nationalism is a, a social movement. That's how we approach it. Um, the anti-Semitic conspiracy theory piece, I wanna unpack just a little bit briefly because um, it matters a lot for, I think, what we see in our schools. So white supremacists, um, you know, a system of oppression that, um, that persecuted people of color for, for a long time. When we had the gains of the civil rights movement, the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, um, they, those folks, those white supremacists had to somehow explain to themselves how um, people of color who are supposed to be a subhuman um, race were able to achieve these successes. And their explanation, um, which white nationalists hold dear, it's a core tenant, is that somebody, some body of people must have been pulling the strings behind the scenes. Some, some group must have been funding this work, must have been um, writing these bills, and that, that somebody were Jewish people, that Jewish people were the puppeteers um, masterminding the successes of the civil rights movement. That is, um, yes, Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Um, that is what we mean when we say an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. So I think we're gonna move on a little bit to what we're seeing now. And Joe touched on this a bit as well, but um, especially in a moment of social upheaval, um, white nationalist groups are, um, are using all their recruitment tactics. They are promoting conspiracy theories, um, racism, xenophobia. They are um, spending a lot of time in online spaces and video game platforms, especially with music um, in um, spaces where our young folks are, gaming chat rooms and things like that, and spreading dis disinformation via targeted campaigns like the one you can see in that picture. Um, in, in you know, pretending that they are um, Black Lives Matter or Antifa activists. I wanna mention really quickly that, um, and this is very important, that, um, these folks are trying to build political power. They're trying to build their base. So this is not just, um, we have hateful messages we're trying to spread around. This is um, really targeted um, recruitment tactics. So Joe mentioned earlier that um, previously, you know, we didn't have um, white supremacists. We're not looking to have young people join their um, movements. And that is definitely different now. We have a lot of organizing by white nationalist groups, both locally and nationally, on college campuses, high schools, um, even middle schools, sort of outright flyering and things like that. Um, but they're, they're very uh, prevalent in online spaces. And uh, they are, I don't think they're as prevalent on, I haven't heard them be as prevalent on TikTok, Nick, as I have in some of the other online spaces, but I'm sure they're, I'm sure they're there too. Yes, and thank you, um, Amanda. The, the, if you wanna spend a, a dark Friday night um, researching how the algorithms work, um, that's certainly, you could spend a long time on that. Um, okay, I co-wrote this toolkit um, with a couple other folks, educators and the Western State Center. Um, and I just wanna make a quick plug because there are a lot of resources in the toolkit for um, faculty and staff, for students, for parents, for administrators you can go to Western State Center's website um, and you can download it. And um, when you do that, they'll add you, um, they'll, they'll send you a note asking if you wanna join the Facebook group that we have. And that's a nice way, um, thank you for that, Amanda. That's a nice way too, to stay in touch with the organization and um, keep on top of upcoming trainings that we might have around some of this stuff. I know there are at least, there's at least one person on here um, who has attended a training before. I won't out them, but feel free to jump in if you want. There might be more folks that, I, um, that I've missed. But um, I think that, let's see here. What do I wanna say next? 
um, I want to say that standing up against white nationalism in our schools is not a, an individual um, activity or effort. It has to be collective work. Um, it has to involve bridge building. It's really hard um, and it's really important. And also baby steps really do make a difference. So um, doing little the little things that you can do within your own um, sphere of influence really matter. And I think one of the best parts of any kind of professional development in this area is that you get to hopefully make some contacts with some of the other folks who are here, um, who I'm sure have a lot of um, information to share, a wealth of it. Quick, Jessica, I just, I just, sorry, I just wanna pop in really quickly and just talk about the, um the toolkit for a second and say, for those of you who are looking for exact phrases to say and say, give me the exact words, the toolkit has those exact words of what you should say and what you shouldn't say for parents, for students, for administrators, for teachers, for the community. It highlights all five of those groups and tells you like, you can copy and paste this quote pretty much. Um, and use it for different scenarios. So again, a link to the toolkit will be in the resource guide. So for those of you who are like, just tell me what to say, um, that's definitely something that you're going to want to download. Thank you so much for the shout out. Um, Western State Center, which produced the toolkit um, is based here in the Pacific Northwest, but does work nationally. And um, we believe that white nationalism poses a direct threat to our democracy and to inclusive communities and certainly schools are um, really important fronts for that. So that's sort of our stake in the mission. Um, okay, so we have a, um, Western State Center has another document that um, I'm gonna pop in the chat and it's kind of, it's geared towards parents and caregivers. So it's not written with a school audience in mind, but it has a bunch of really great questions. And I think it's useful. So I want to just talk a little bit about that for a second. Um, the, the, um, sometimes when we're in a classroom environment, I know for myself, I'll just speak for myself, um, you know, sometimes when this anti-democratic rhetoric or um, white nationalism or, um, you know, behaviors or language comes into the space, I don't feel always ready for it. And um, it's hard to continue to open up a conversation, to take care of the students in the room, um, to prevent harm, to make sure that folks in this, your space are clear on, on your values, on the values of the classrooms, of the classroom space or the school community. It can feel really tricky and um, I totally know that. So one of the things I like about the link that I popped in the chat is that there are a whole bunch of um, conversation starters that maybe might help you to have some of these conversations with students um, and perhaps a conversation that you can, um, something you can address in the moment in your class and then perhaps take to a conversation that you might have um, privately a little bit later. Um, and I also just wanna put another plug in here, lean on lean on people. It's, it can feel isolating to be in our classrooms alone all day long, especially if we're in our, we're our virtual classrooms. Um, so, you know, hopefully you have um, colleagues and counseling staff and librarians and things like that that you might be able to um, reach out to and use as a resource. So, um, when students are engaged in um, or exploring some of these anti-democratic or white nationalist ideals, it can look like all sorts of things. And a lot of this depends on the age of the student um, and your response probably also depends on how well you know, you know them and you know what they're, um, what they're experiencing. But the document sort of walks you through kind of levels of engagement. So first you might have um, a student who accidentally encounters hateful messages. They might not um, have any real involvement in the context. They might not know what it means. Um, they might've just seen a Pepe Le Frog um, avatar and thought it looked cool and popped it into their online profile. Um, they might really not have a sense of what they're sharing. And so there are some prompts and suggestions for how you can respond to those students, how you can talk to them and, and inquire um, what they know and why they chose Pepe the Frog, um, who is a hate symbol. And we can talk about that later. Um, then you might have an example of students who are sharing jokes or memes to be edgy. And this is a real um, strategy of the white nationalist movement. They want folks to, um, they want their material to be cool. They want to be able to say, oh, I'm just being funny. You have no sense of humor. The, you know, the, the lib liberals are so sensitive, these snowflakes. Um, this is a lot of their rhetoric that they use. And, and I don't know about you, but I hear students parroting that quite frequently. Um, then there might be students who are asserting far-right beliefs in their daily life, and this might be coming from um, their parents, 
their family. It might be coming from their own experiences or some online spaces, but these are students who are, are pushing um, the boundaries more specifically and, and are being hurtful to others um, with their language or, or worse. Um, and that requires, you know, a different kind of response. So we have sort of a, a range of what we see, um, student engagement, and it's just much easier if we have the opportunity. I know this is um, goes without saying, but if we have the opportunity to talk to students as they're initially starting to express different, you know, their political ideas in different ways than they have before, or if they're starting to um, show up to in your school spaces with symbols that you don't recognize, those are the moments um, that we can start to address with them what they're experiencing or seeing online. Okay, that was a lot, but um, I want to give you a chance to talk with each other for a little bit. So I'm going to um, also pop in the chat a, a um, link that you can use that will have these scenarios on it and it'll have some questions on it too. And my goal is that we can put you into some breakout rooms in a second. Um, and you can look at these scenarios and you can look at the questions. They sort of escalate a little bit and you can um, discuss with yourselves and share some of the experience, the wealth of knowledge that's already in this space. And then we'll come back and we'll do a little share out um, before we get to some questions. So Amanda, are you good to do breakout rooms? I okay. am. Great. Um, here are the questions you're gonna be looking at. They are also on that um, Google doc I sent you if you're someone who likes to just take a picture on your phone, that's okay too. Yeah, awesome. So yeah, in the breakout rooms really start to uh, differentiate where people are on that spectrum of the comments that they're saying, because that will hopefully, um, you will respond differently based on where they are. So we will see you. We're going to give you, let's do eight to nine minutes. See you in a bit. want to say, obviously 90 minutes is not enough for a topic like this. Uh, Joe and Jessica and I were just speaking like this is an entire day session, but we're virtual and online and no one's coming to a full day session. So uh, really, again, this session is like an overview glimpse of just, again, listening to other people, learning about what's out there for you. Um, and so in the last 10 minutes, if you can put in the chat, just something that your group was talking about, a question that you have that we can answer, because we do want to use these last, again, 10, 15-ish minutes, because we can stay on a little bit longer to answer some questions. Um, what other questions that you have? And I know one of the things that popped up for me in the breakout room that I was in, and then I know I've talked to teachers about, is what happens if your school or classroom is not politically, ethnically, racially diverse? and somebody says something hurtful, harmful, racist, and there's nobody from that community that's in there, that's in, in the school or in your class, and how do you share with students that that is hurtful and harmful when somebody from that community is not represented? And so, I mean, when I've talked to teachers, it's like, also, how are you sharing that even though I'm not a part of that group and I'm not the target of your comments, how does that still hurt you as a person? And how are you sharing that with your students and say, although I'm not black or although I may not be gay, those are still hurtful and harmful things when I hear them. I think that's a great um, point too, that your so back to the original um, opening prompt, like your schools or your classroom values can come into play there. Um, you know, and I think this applies if we're talking about elementary school or if we're talking about high school. Um, if you have some some values, some class norms to lean on, it doesn't matter, you know, what identities you have represented in your classroom. This is just not, um, you know, this is not how we behave in our space because we care about um, all people or whatever it might be. Um, and I think that somebody put it in the chat, but it's really important to both address um, something in the moment. And it could be, you know, maybe it's, it's, you know, so much of it's situational, but maybe it's as simple as saying like um, that, you know, that doesn't, that's not how we behave here. Or that's the, that doesn't honor the classroom values or norms that we have. Um, and I disagree with you and that's really hurtful, um, you know, but I want to, I want us to have a, another conversation about that, or let's put that to the side for a minute and um, do something else. It's really important that other students see that we are addressing something in the moment, but it's also really 
um, important often, depending on what's happening for your relationship with the student um, to be able to have some time to dig in a little bit with them about why they might have brought whatever they did into the space. Mm -hmm. um, and I know somebody had asked a question before about are there any racist articles or policies that are still around that nobody calls attention to? And I'm looking at Andrew Duded, who put together our um, our experience on our um, uh, on our discrimination and resistance exhibition, and looking at the racial covenants. And a lot of not a lot of you, but some of you may have racial covenants still on your property deeds. And we know in Lake Oswego, Andrew was doing research. Um, there was a man last year who was trying to get rid of the racial covenant in his property deed. And people were making it very difficult to do that. So property deeds still have those racial covenants in them sometimes. Um, and there's a great interactive Google map for the Portland area that highlights um, what those deeds were. Andrew, yes. And then I definitely want to get to Joe answering the question. Yeah, before. just really quickly. I mean, another interesting thing in the course of my research is I found out that the first house that I owned in Portland had a racial covenant on it in a very, very small development in Southwest Portland. It was just four, four houses in a row uh, on a city street that the owner that developed that property uh, had created racial covenants. Yeah. Thanks, Amanda. Yeah. You're like the history expert on that now. So Joe, I want to turn back to you to maybe answer that first question of like, how do we even go about talking about the history with our students of democracy in America and how it started and how that's anti-democratic to what we understand democracy to be today? Because that's complicated. So if you want to give us some of your insights into that. Yeah, that, it's such a great question, and a, and probably the most important question in some ways. You know, it, it's um, obviously you know British North America was first uh, you know um, uh, profit making uh, you know venture and an imperial project. So it wasn't as if you know this new nation was conceived in liberty to begin with. Uh, but even at the time of the founding, um, you know there were. You know, when I teach this to undergraduates, I say there was always kind of anti-democratic -de and anti-democratic um, struggles going on. You know, that the um, a lot of state constitutions were. I mean, you, well, one you have slavery, obviously, you know, and you have native dispossession. So those are founding things, right? And then propertyless whites don't have the vote either. Women obviously don't have the vote. Very few people, a tiny majority of people, have any political power at all at the founding. And then the constitution itself is not. A democratic document. I mean, partly there's a series of compromises with slavery in it, but you know, the Electoral College is not democratic. Obviously, the three fifths rule wasn't democratic. The Supreme Court is really not a democratic body in any in any meaningful sense of the term. So we're already starting with something that the, at the founding the founders themselves actually didn't use the term democracy. They would have used the term republic. Uh, and so it's always been a series of struggles. I think if, when people ask like, what is there to identify with? There's always been struggles for liberation. From the founding, you know, from you know, from among them, the abolitionist movement uh, and the more radical elements of the abolitionist movement, and uh, um, um, the labor movement, and women's suffrage, and civil rights, and Black liberation, and Stonewall. You know, there are there's continual there's continual pushes for democratic expansion, for greater rights and liberties, and for a struggle against you know, the powerful on behalf of broader numbers of people. But it's not, sometimes that story is told that there's always progress, right, towards this greater, more democratic way. We're achieving, it's America achieving itself and that kind of thing. But I think the more important thing is that there's as many reversals as there are kind of a unidirectional thing about democracy in America. There's, there's you know, uh, voting rights are given, but then they're or fought for, but then they're lost again. Uh, other kinds of social and political rights are, are won and then lost again. And the, you know things turn in really um, reactionary and directions a lot of the time. So it's always a matter of struggle, I think, and always a matter of popular uh, fights to, to expand um, uh, democracy. And that, you know, and one way to talk to students maybe is to say like, which, where would you like to identify? Which people would you like to identify with? Which, you know, what, what kind of founders do you want to identify with or what kind of people throughout 
you know, American history do you, what would you want to have been on the side of, you know, and see it as a continual dynamic as opposed to either a static past or a unidirectional past. So I guess I would kind of, um, you know, put it in those terms. Hmm. Thank you. And before I pass it off to Amit for the question on the First Amendment, um, I was looking at some of the comments about like shame and guilt. And for those of you who have been to a professional development with me before, um, I will say it again if you haven't. Uh, no one gets shamed out of being a white nationalist or part of an extremist movement. No one. You cannot say to kids, how dare you like think that or that's really stupid or make them feel shame about their thoughts. It does come with compassion and planting seeds and critical thought, um, which is really hard sometimes. But I just want to clarify that no one gets shamed out of being a white nationalist or in, or in any sort of like movement along those lines. So I did put in the chat the link to the survey. So for those of you who do need to go, thank you. For those of you ha who have an opportunity to stay on a little bit longer and hear some more of the Q&A, by all means, please feel free to stay on. Amit does a lot of work on the First Amendment, um, especially when it comes to the every student belong rule. So Amit, if somebody is like, First Amendment, this is my claim, I can say whatever I want. How, how do you go about talking to students about that? And what did you do in, in your classroom? Yeah, so um, like I put in the chat there, there's this balance between, you know, student speech that is political and is protected, taking words of Des Moines, like that that stuff is, is real. And and we just have to be you know conscious of what, what happens there. So when a student walks in with a political campaign slogan, um, then that is protected speech, right? So the question then is, um, you know, what is this teacher doing or what is the school done to create a climate in which you can talk to these students about, you know, what that speech might be doing, how it might be impacting other students. And so something like build a wall, um, although that's, that's a loud speech, um, I mean, it would be a First Amendment speech, um, that maybe isn't something that you would, you know, want to just have in your, in your school without addressing it with that student, right? And so that, but that's about setting the climate. Um, in a classroom discussion, if a student should invoke like their First Amendment right, um, you know, it's sort of up to the teacher to determine like, well, just as we were seeing in those scenarios, like what is the way to redirect um, some of those comments uh, and not get into sort of a power struggle over whether this is a First Amendment issue or not. Um, but if it's something that's straight up sort of like hateful speech, um, like, you know, those kids should go home or, you know, whatever, like send them back to their country. Um, those are sort of bias incidents that are covered in, in your student code of conduct. Um, and so all schools have adopted the Every Student Belongs language in the Emergency Act as of um, January. Um, and now we're re-looking at the guidance for um, with the passage of Every Student Belongs on February 18th. So all that should be sort of covered. But I think in the end, like it is about what you've done in your classroom to, to sort of set that climate. And so just going off of that, Amit, so all of you know it's coming down the pipeline. Um, I'm creating a lesson that will support um, the Every Student Belongs mandate um, that looks at language and how language means different things to different people and how it could be hurtful or harmful depending on the context that it's in. So if you have specific language that you want to be included, please let me know. But like some of the words that we're looking at are illegal, alien, unique, sassy, strong. Um, what were the other words, Amit? We just did this with our teacher advisory board. I'm thinking about all of them now. Crazy is another one, thinking about gendered language. Gay. So if you grew up in the 90s, like me, that was just a common phrase. Um, but how has that evolved? And what does that mean in different contexts? Exotic is another one. So when you're calling somebody exotic, how is that harmful? Um, so really looking at the microaggressions and talking about that with your students on a very low level. Um, I'm all about definitions and how are we learning about these definitions? Who taught you about these definitions? What do they look, sound, and feel like? Because you can't have these higher level conversations if you're on different understandings what these definitions mean. So 
I urge you to sometimes come back to your foundations a little bit. Are there any other questions that people have? We can do our best to answer them for you. Okay, if you have questions, I will definitely stay on for a little bit. Um, and again, I wanna thank all of you for being here, for taking time out of your day. That blog post that Jessica shared um, that has the six parts about the scales of expression and how, um, how speech and behavior can escalate. I really, really encourage you to read the entire blog post and look at the questions that are in there because I thought it did such a phenomenal job of saying, okay, well, if a kid is just looking at memes, how might I talk to them rather than if somebody is expressing explicit white nationalist ideology? Because you have to address those as separate things or you have to address them in different ways. So go back and go look at that blog post because um, that to me out of all of the resources was one of the most tangible, useful resources I've found um, for direct for direct implementation in the moment. But again, I will stay on. Thank you again so, so, so much for being here. I look forward to your feedback and hopefully seeing you at the professional development to talk about conspiracy theories, which feeds into this as well, um, because I know a lot of you are unfortunately also um, dealing with that. <laughs>